Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Charles Somer Smith. I'm a senior director at Blaine Southern, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all this evening. It's the first time I've appeared publicly in my new role, <laughs> and I'm very delighted to be able to introduce and welcome Enrique Martinez Chalaya. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is talk informally for as long as I can carry on asking questions. And then I'm going to turn to the audience and I would encourage you all to ask questions. I've realised from the warmth of the greetings at the back of the room that there are lots of people who have known Enrique for much longer than I have known him. I met him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so do not think that I come to this discussion with a great deal of privileged knowledge. All I've done is read his entry in Wikipedia and enjoy and admire the <laughs> exhibition. So I'm starting more or less from fresh, except that I went to the library and I couldn't find anything about him. And then I realized it's because this great tome, which is his collected writings, was downstairs on the sales desk. <laughs> <laughs> and just in case I forget, at the end, Enrique is going to sign copies of his catalogue, which is on sale tonight. So if I forget, please buy some copies. Um, I thought maybe it would be helpful if, before we start, I would just give a very quick introduction, but I may get facts of his life wrong, in which case he can correct me. Born in 1964 in Cuba, he and his parents moved to Madrid in 1972 with only a suitcase. We'll come back to all of this in more detail. Uh, then went to Puerto Rico, where you must have been staggeringly well taught. I won't ask any of these questions, I'll just run through it. Just because he's read everything, um, philosophy, literature, history of art. But he was trained as a scientist at Cornell, but took classes in art. But he was on track to be a scientist up to the age of 26, when he went to a lighthouse off the coast south of San Francisco and decided to switch from science. You had already got a PhD. Never, never finished it. Never finished. Uh, uh, um, to go to the University of California in Santa Barbara and had his first exhibition the same year he enrolled um, as a student at the University of California at Santa Barbara. So it's a very, very unusual and interesting trajectory for an artist. Unusual, certainly, for artists in this country, but I suspect unusual uh, also for artists in the United States. And, and also I think it's very unusual that not only has he been very successful as an artist, as you'll see from the works in the exhibition, but he's published really a lot about his work, not just about his work, but he's a blogger uh, and um, writes about poetry and ideas and about art practice in a very serious and thoughtful way. So, I thought I would start by getting you to talk a bit about your first eight years in Cuba. Yeah, well, thank you for being here tonight. Um, so my, um, my family had come from two, two very different sides, economically, my father and mother. And those early years in Cuba was just after the revolution. Yeah. So Cuba was still in great transition. Uh, it was a Cuba where the specter of exit, of traveling, of moving to Spain in particular and the United States was everywhere. Because lots of people took the boat. L lots of people um, left in the 60s. Yeah. Um, so by the time we asked for our exit, which was in 1969 when we asked for it, right. um, a lot of people had already left. So the idea of migration and exile was in every, in every conversation. And certainly in my family's conversation, every, every dinner, 
big dinner like Nochebuena or something like that was punctuated with tears and the specter of living to Spain, and we, which we eventually did, as you said, in 1972. Um, my father left first, and then my mother, my brother and I left. Um, after. But that was because they didn't like the society in Cuba. I mean, they yeah, were they, they, were, they were not sympathizers of the revolution. And, and it was time, you know, my grandfather, who had, was a Spaniard, who come, came during the Civil War, right. he never wanted to, to go to leave Cuba. And so he said he would die in Cuba. So the rest of the family slowly migrated. We were the first ones. Um, and we went to Madrid, which at the time was a place that a lot of Cubans went. You couldn't come, go to the United States anymore. So Madrid, during Franco, was a time, was a, you know, a contrasting, in many ways, place to live, uh, from Cuba's under Castro to Spain during, you know, under Franco. <laughs> It's almost like you're writing a history of dictatorships. Um, so, so that was our life. And but, so how far do you still think of yourself as Cuban? Or, I mean, because the one and only time I've been to Miami, there obviously is a very strong community of Cubans in exile. And I, I don't know how much you've sort of been a part of that sort of community or given up on it. Yeah, I, I never felt very Cuban, even when I was in Cuba as a kid. I just went to, the, to do the Havana Biennial in Cuba, um, and it was my first time there in 47 years. Okay, so, in so many that's not very Cuban. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in many ways, I see, when I go there, many aspects of who I am in Cuba. That being said, my own sense of, um, you know, there's a domestic aspect, a sort of a, a historical memory that exists with families, yeah. which I think in, in my case is inevitably Cuban, partly. But, but you know, part of, my, part of migration means that you gain the world. So I can, I feel occasionally German because of German, all the German literature I'm interested in. I might, I feel quite American, particularly Californian. Um, Spanish You were in times. Florida for a bit. I mean, you, you, you've spent most of your adult career in Los Angeles. Yeah, Is that right. My time in Florida was almost like a second exile. Okay. <laughs> it, felt, it felt like uh, going to the moon a little bit, but yeah. Because it's such a different society. Such a different place. I never felt part of it. And, and around the Cuban community, my father lives there and my right. aunts and so on. Um, I, I, re I felt less Cuban than ever. So, you know. That's probably not exactly true. There are moments in which I feel very Cuban in some of the parties and things. But, um, but yeah, I, it was a time in Cuba. I went to, to Florida because I had this sort of Hemingway idea of Florida, that I was going to be in a barrier island and, and be in the sea, and, and there would be no regular 20th century life anymore. But, but that, it was, was just I, boring. Yeah, it was, <laughs> there was a lot of things that were not exactly me, but, then, but it was good. And then before we leave Cuba, so to speak, can you talk a bit about your attitude to your parents' Catholicism? Because it seems to me, I mean, the first thing I felt seeing the exhibition, even before I read some of the tajals and some of the inscriptions, that it is sort of imbued with an, a memory of some form of religious iconography. But I know from reading about your life that you've rejected all of that. So you, don't, you, you probably don't see it that way. Well, you know, Cuba was the le one of the less Catholic of all the Latin countries, right. even before the revolution. When the revolution came, the churches were closed and, and there was almost no religion when I was um, a kid. Santeria, which is sort of the Spanish version of voodoo, if you want to think about it that way, was a presence in my life when I saw it growing up. And it continued in Puerto Rico years later. So I was interested in belief yeah. uh, and the idea of people who do things uh, because they have this support external to themselves, particularly my parents, my mother, who is a believer. Um, but to me, it was never, I, I was always, I had always problems with religion, Catholicism in particular. Um, and I went through... Um, so you, you had to go to church to, and then rejected it 
age 13 or? Oh, at 11, yeah. in, in, when I was in Spain during my first communion at the Church of San Francisco el Grande, I don't know if you know Madrid, but it's a really great grand church in Spain. I walked out of my first communion and never okay. went back to church. Okay, there. So that, that was my goodbye. <laughs> that, that explains your attitude to <laughs> your religion. Okay, but can we talk a bit about the sort of religious iconography? I mean, doves, I forget the exact inscription on this, but there's yeah. a sense of, of wanting to deal with um, images which are imbued with an element of sacramental significance. It's the way I read them. Not, not specifically Christian or Catholic, but it feels as if you've absorbed the vocabulary of, of religious iconography in some way. So, so I, I, I tend to see this question in two ways. One of them is um, there's a Wittgenstein, Wittgenstein uh, said this thing that when I read it the first time, it immediately rang through for me. He said, I'm not religious, but I can help but look at life on a religious point of view. Right. And I think okay. that remains okay. true for yeah. me. And I also think that sort of the religious and biblical imagery taps into questions of being and the landscape and our place in the universe and so on, which are inherently the preoccupation of sort of existential philosophy. So, so in many ways, when you look at the sea or you look at the landscape or you look at the sense of mortality, those things look religious, but they precede religion. They, in many okay. ways, they, okay. are, they so, are the territory of religion. It's, it's the life of the interior mind. Uh, yeah, and our right. place, and our place in, in this world. Yeah. Uh, so then, in Spain, you spent a lot of time in the Prado. I mean, one of the other things I, I, I particularly find interesting is the extent to which you're deeply knowledgeable and influenced by artists who now aren't really part of the everyday life of art schools in this country. I mean, Titian and Velazquez are not people nowadays who artists generally quote, whereas you, you obviously did absorb uh, um, 16th century painting in, in a more serious way than most artists nowadays. I mean, I was lucky that when I lived in Spain, um, as a poor kid in Madrid, there was not a great many things to do. And one of the things that you could do in Madrid for free was to go to the Prado Museum. Um, and I walk into that Velasquez room, and I remember that feeling the first time I saw it. Um, I, I still get that feeling every time I walk in there, and the feeling is, this is unbelievable. Can anybody else do anything better? Um, and certainly as a painter, it's an intimidated room to walk in. I mean, the answer is they can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, um, but, um, but, you know, then, then I spent sort of looking at those titians that you mentioned that were picked by Velasquez for the Prado um, with, by his own hand, and, um, and the Goyas and Surbarang and Murillo and everything else that is there. And it was a great education. And in many ways, we tend to think in contemporary art that all the problems of contemporary art started 40 years ago. Yeah. But I think the problems of painting has been around for a long time. And I think it's hard to imagine solving them better than Velasquez did. Um, we might, maybe we have to solve it in a different way now. But I think Velasquez, just as an example, it's always giving me a run for my money, and I'm always losing in that run. And you were taught art in Spain as a child? I was. I was an in apprentice. In school or, or I was an apprentice for a painter, okay. um, which basically meant I just worked and cleaned brushes and occasionally got to look at him doing something. So um, your parents encouraged that? I mean, No, I, I was not the greatest kid on earth, <laughs> and, um, and my parents thought that putting me in something like that would calm me down. Okay. Um, and that, so it was kind of like somewhat of a function of daycare. But um, so I, I spent a lot of time helping him. And then when I went to Puerto Rico, I continued that as an apprenticeship, which was invaluable to me. So, so will you talk now a little bit about science and sort of, so in high school, you, you became, you did science 
he must have done sufficiently much in order to get a scholarship to Cornell. Well, you know, like I think that I always felt since I was a little kid that I understood less than most people, that most people seem to be moving through life with an understanding of the world that, that eludes me. And um, so I tried to figure out in art, through reading, and ultimately through science. I thought that physics in particular and math will answer what the world was. So I was very passionate about math and, and loved it, and I thought that art and literature would be things I kept on the side in my life but that, that the real big questions that were pressing to me were the questions of science. So I wanted to be a, originally a nuclear physicist, well, first a theoretical physicist, then a nuclear physicist, and then became a laser physicist. Yeah. Do you keep up with it? I mean, can one keep up with it? As a, I mean, that art you can, you can do on the side of science, but can you do science on the side of art at all? Not really, you know, I, can, I read still science, yeah. but High-level physics is a very mathematical field that you have to stay on top of the math, not just on top of the concepts. So my own thesis, um, when I look at it now, I barely understand it. Right. And it has my name on it, but I, it's like written <laughs> in another language. So, so it's, it's hard to keep up with it. So will you talk a bit about this moment in the lighthouse when you were 26 and you went off for five days in November, whenever it was? 1990 or? 1990, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and you were trying to figure out what to do with your life. Yeah, that was a hard moment. And you know, what it, one of the things that I find hard about talking about it is that when you talk about it from the point of view of being here in this exhibition, yeah. it seems like a triumphant moment of decision. Yeah. But at the moment, it was a moment of feeling like a loser in some ways, that you can, you are pulling this for different ways. You can decide what is the right path. So I went to this lighthouse. I was doing research at a place called Brookhaven in Long Island while doing my doctorate at Berkeley. And, and, uh, and I went to this lighthouse for five days. Sequestered you myself. You stayed there? I stayed yeah. there. Okay. I stayed it's there. A, it's a lighthouse with accommodation. It, it yeah. has a little um, keeper's house right. that you can stay and then walk the, the beaches okay. and during okay. the day and wrote as much as possible. So it basically was a, a fight for for a certain sense of destiny, of what is it that I wanted to do with my life. And it meant overriding my family, overriding their dreams. I'm the oldest. They Over were delighted, because even in spite of your difficult childhood, you were turning into <laughs> nuclear physicist. Yeah, I mean, yeah. exactly. Yeah, I mean, it was when you were an immigrant. That was a career path. A career path yeah. that, that yeah. promised some success. Yeah. I, it was already a disappointment that I was not a medical doctor, which all okay. Cubans want to be. but. Um, <laughs> But, Th but that's I, because of the professional ambition of people who have been professionally successful in their own country and then are forced to migrate and they want their children to exactly. do well. Yeah. Exactly. And um, so at the end of those five days, I decided that I was going to try this thing of being an artist. I, did, I, I have been painting for a long, long time, but I didn't know anything about what it meant to be an artist in the world. Mm -hmm. So I worked as a scientist for the next two years trying to build what turns out to be not that many reserves or anything, but I thought it was going to be a, st a strategy. Um, so I worked for a laser company designing lasers. And in the weekends and night, I painted. Um, and then I went back and finished my MFA, which I had started while doing my doctorate, but I dropped out of both. Um, and then I was lucky that I offer, got offered an exhibition early on, um, and things sort of well, one of the things I read this afternoon, which actually I was, I have to say, interested by, because reading about you, it feels as if you've gone relatively straightforwardly to every kind of honorary visiting professorship all over the, in Maine and in the University of Nebraska, now a fellow at the Huntington and a professor at the University of Southern California. But I read in... in I think in this book, which was the earlier book about your sort of life and writings, that you had sold paintings in a park in, in San Francisco. So that, no. that's sort of not a straightforward thing to do. No, it was not a straightforward. You know, when, when one tells these stories, they always sound more straightforward and more uh, heroic than they feel at the time that you're going through them. 
when you're going through them, you feel that you're giving up opportunities that were given to you. I saw my work in the parks, if any of you have ever done it or seen people doing it, it's tremendously humiliating. Yeah. People, yeah. you might dislike this painting, but you're unlikely to say anything about it in front of me. When you're in the parks, people don't, don't hold back. <laughs> um, they tell you right then and there. And it's just not, you know, after all that education, to sit there in the parks for eight hours and trying to sell a painting was not glamorous. So They must now regret they didn't buy, buy one. Somebody <laughs> said to me at the weekend that Peter Doig worked as a barman at Two Bridges Place and he knew him well as the barman. He now wishes that he had uh, asked him for some of his work. But, um, so then you started teaching. And, and the other thing I thought was interesting was that you resigned from Pomona College, where you were then quite well established as a professor, with a sort of quite vehement letter of resignation that you thought that there was no point teaching art if it was just treated in a dilettante way. Yeah, it, yeah, it, it was another difficult decision. I was tenured at what was in America, it remains number one liberal arts college. It right. was a very good position. Um, but I just felt that I didn't want to, to participate. You know, for those of you who are familiar with academia, there are some wonderful things in academia. And in fact, the reservoir of our knowledge and possibility probably resides in academia. But there's also a lot of politics and sort of a small time aspects to academia. And after a while, I felt that, um, that I was participating in some sort of um, machinery that I was not interested in being part of. Because so. you didn't think that the type of teaching which was being offered was worthwhile, or, or because you didn't like the way the, the faculty worked? Uh, I mean, was it a personality issue or an intellectualism? I think the seriousness of it. I like yeah. the students, and I, I always love the students, and I continue my engagements in, in, in other ways with students. Um, in other institutions, Dartmouth, Nebraska, and so on. But um, I just didn't think they, they were serious enough. Mm. You know, one of the challenges... Because uh, Pomona's a rich Southern Californian No, because, because I think this is a condition of most colleges. Right. I think that um, this may be an unpopular position to take, but um, I think the arts have a tendency to sometimes have a tendency in institutions to, to have to fight against being dabblers right. in a lot of right. things. I mean, in physics, you don't get too many dabblers in, yeah. in, the, in a graduate program, but you might get them in the arts. And sometimes the system maintains that. The yeah. faculty do not want to be discovered as, as posers, and the students don't want to be discovered as posers, so they, they're always exceptional people within all of that but quite often they're the people carrying the institution. But I mean, that's one of the things that I find interesting about your career and your writing, that certainly my sort of vicarious experience of art teaching in this country, as you describe, is the Pomona College um, model where you're given freedom to experiment and it's not seen as a very serious, I mean, a deeply serious intellectual endeavor. It may be, but, but my sense is it's more about given, given, being given space to experiment and explore and all of that side of things. And now the idea that you're being taught something which has a deep history and, and a, d a deep intellectual seriousness is an unfashionable view. I think it is, and I think when you respect something and when you value something very deeply, it's hard to, um, it's hard to be patient around mm -hmm. things that maybe you don't feel they're, people are not treating it as well. It's easier to be casual about things you don't care so much. There are many things that I don't care that much about, and I yeah. can be very casual and graceful around it. But the things that mean a lot to me is very difficult to, to remain passive when you see some uh, lack of seriousness. So now we've probably talked enough about your life. Can we talk about the art? And Should we start with what's behind us? And can you talk a bit about 
the image which everybody can see rather than talking about things which are in the room which some people will have seen but not necessarily. Just m maybe you don't want to. Well, no, no, I, I can. It's so so yeah. let me just frame that uh, saying something about yeah. this. By s yeah. So I create um, exhibitions that I co call, think of it as environments, as a way an installation artist will think of it as an environment. Right. And those, um, they, they begin with writings, my writings, and then in the process of making them, I go back and forth between writing, painting, sculpting, sometimes photograph or videos, whatever it may be. Um, and the idea is that I, I have a model of this gallery right from the beginning. And I imagine what happens when people walk through that door as they move through here. So even though you're looking at discrete images, mm -hmm. um, there is definitely a movement here. I, I prefer to use the word movement rather than narrative. Um, and at the center of that project, I think, is some preoccupation with uh, uh, my understanding of, of, of the world in itself. I'm interested in, in existential questions, but I'm also interested in the nature of painting itself, the nature of art. How does it come to be? What is the experience of it? How do we receive it? How do we understand it? So when people look at my work, they tend to look at it in terms of images, because that's what's offered itself first. But most of the things that take me the longest in the process of working is everything else that is not the image. Is how does a painting exist as a thought? How does it come to be? Uh, what is the relationship between the experience of painting and the painting itself? Where is the painting actually happening? In the here or in between you and the painting? So my paintings are to be experienced. So even though the, this is a stunningly beautiful catalog, very well and thoughtfully done, but despite that, these paintings are to be experienced. Um, they're made like that, and they don't, they, they not necessarily photograph as I intended them to feel, which is not always the case. Now, to be honest, I mean, I, I, I found, because inevitably I'd only seen your things in reproduction, and I, I, I found the experience of seeing them in reproduction from the reality. Of course, that's true of all art, but it's, it felt particularly true of yours. That so in a way, they reproduce too easily because they're subject uh, uh, narrative paintings, and then you, d you don't see the complexity of the way they're actually painted in some way. Right, right. So these paintings behind, coming yeah. back to your questions and this sort of... They're very unusual. Um, as you, if you look through my books, you'll see I rarely will ever repeat anything that looks like something else. So the idea of, of the constancy of three paintings of identical size, identical theme, and identical color is incredibly rare and very, very difficult for me to do. Um, but from the beginning of this exhibition, I wanted the vertex between this room and that room to be these paintings. Um, the paintings that you could Im imagine to be the end of the day, if you wanted to imagine that. But they're really, in my mind, I think of them alchemically, like, like the sea as it becomes gold. Um, for my show in Berlin, I did a series of burnt trees that were becoming gold, which is, you know, very, it's almost fairy tale imagery. So in here is actually the entire exhibition turning between this room and that in this gold vertex. Um, it's just a wave crashing. And they, they all have writing, only that piece of writing survived there. Which is your writing or It's my quotation? writing. Right. Everything okay. in these in this paintings is my writing except for the painting at the introduction which is hinged. And the, the stack of papers is by William Blotter Gates and the writing in the back of the paintings by Coleridge. Otherwise, everything is my writing. What, one of the things I found particularly interesting, I think you encouraged me to look at the video. There's a video of the painting behind this wall of the prophet. Now, from the way you've described the gestation of the exhibition, it's thought through and it's considered and in the catalogue you can see there's a lot of writing behind each of the paintings. But then when you watch the video, you see you change the subject. A, there's no drawing at all, so there's no predetermination. And B, you, you change pretty well every aspect of the subject and what it represents and what the shark is. 
um, as you go along. And that, that seems like a very interesting combination of conscious and subconscious in the way you work. Yeah, I think that that is right. That, that, that constant shifting between conscious and subconscious is at play. But it's also that, and this would be a very annoying thing for me to say when you're surrounded by these paintings that have specific subjects, and that is that the subjects are only instances through which I work. So they are not the end in themselves. There are people, particularly people who focus on, on symbols or, or perhaps semiotics or, or culture, they're very interested in what, in what those subjects or motifs are. But to me, they're a point of departure to reveal something else that may be deeper right. uh, than what I originally thought was important. So, so before, actually, no, because I want to ask you a bit about other projects you're doing. Um, can, can we talk about, you said yesterday that you use your son as to sit at some point. So that, again, th it's not a portrait in any way, but you used, used your son to model it. And I'd be interested in, because I have a background of interest in portraiture, your attitude to the figure and sitters and how you relate to people you're depicting. Yeah. Well, I, I used to do portraits in my teenage years. That's sort of what, what okay. I did. And I sort of wondered, presumably the person you were taught by in Puerto Rico did was traditional portraits. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. That's, and that's what I first did. In fact, whenever I tell my mother that I have an exhibition, she said, if they were only were to see the portraits I have. <laughs> so so um, anyway. So, so portraiture is important to me, yeah. but, and it's inevitable that if I'm using my son, the fragility of a 15-year-old boy with all the coming of age aspects of it, which is the reason why I chose him, come into play. So even though it's not about my son, my son's and everything that he represents comes to be imbued in that painting, and my response to the painting is different because of it. Mm. For example, he has this very piercing blue eyes, and you can see how messy those eyes are. And part, part of the reason why they're so messy is because uh, the tension, if we're to render those eyes properly, they becomes, the painting will be stolen by the eyes. So, so the portrait of how, the, how, you, how you navigate the portrait in a painting that is bigger than the specific um, sitter in there, or about something other than the specific sitter, requires to be they'd be treated differently. The little girl in the, in the shark painting is my daughter. So this is a very unusual show that I have two of my kids in the show, but it's really not about them in any way. Yeah, we wouldn't know that if you hadn't happened to mention it in right. conversation yesterday. And it's sort of, it's recognizable, but it's a portrait of adolescence, or it's, it's not a portrait of an individual, nor, nor is the girl. Right, nor is the yeah. girl, yeah. yeah. Okay, so b before I ask the audience for questions, can, can you talk a bit about other things you're doing at the moment, other projects? I guess last night you've got exhibitions opening elsewhere. Yeah, so I, I am working on, um, I am interested in many different things, so um, I'm currently having some, some writing projects, a couple of museum projects that I'm working on. Um, oh, they talk about the Hispanic Museum, I thought that was interesting. Yeah, so, so, um, so there is an institution in, in, in the United States um, called the Hispanic Society in New York, which a lot of people don't know, even you have gone to New York many times, but it has one of the greatest collections of Spanish painting in the United States. In fact, Harmor Goya's in the Metropolitan Museum. Um, so, but for years was sort of an institution dedicated to mostly scholastic work. And he has taken... And, and it was sort of just north of Harlem, so to go there, now it's fine, it's all prosperous and gentrified, but there was a time in the 70s where going, going to the Hispanic society wasn't totally straightforward. Right, right. So, so, they, so they, he has been the chairman of the board of the institution now is uh, Philippe de Montevallo, who used to be uh, at the Metropolitan Museum for many years. And he's interested in having, having the the society sort of be, the museum be in conversations with with the world more than it has been before um, so he he has asked that um, 
when we have talked about the idea that, that when they renovate this new gallery that they're creating, perhaps doing some, some sort of uh, project there in, in relationship to, to the work that exists in the collection, the Goyas and Velazquez and so on. Interestingly enough, the Velazquez of Las Meninas, the little Menina head that is there in the collection was the photograph that my mom used to fold my first grade notebook. So I have, and I still have that notebook, so if I ever do a show, I'm gonna have to make sure I insert that notebook somewhere. Okay, okay, I'm gonna <laughs> open it up, so, so please ask questions. Yes. Oh, uh, hang on a minute, I have a feeling that we have a roving mic. Is that, do, we, do we have to have the roving mic? Yes, so yeah. wait for the roving mic. Put your hand up and, yes, the drive right back. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm a painter like you. Um, first time I've seen your work. Uh, these three paintings I think are, are stunning. I really think they're stunning. Um, but it's interesting what you say about the, the, you get the gallery and it's almost like an installation for you. You design the show the space. So here's a question. I come in and I want to buy those three paintings. How do you respond to that? I don't want anything else. I just want those They're three. available. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a conversation well, afterwards. Is that question? <laughs> <laughs> is that question to yeah. Because you're here to make money. <laughs> you see this work as holistic, as, as one piece of work. And you've obviously gone to a great deal of trouble to you know, design work, uh, I use the word design, but you know, you know, I think you know what I mean. So how do you feel about your work being split up? That's a very good question. So I look at it as a family portrait. So if you, I have two brothers, so if you were to see us together, you will see that a lot of my mannerisms are also in my brother and also in my younger brother. And you can see a lot of things that are similar, but that does not mean that you cannot take me as myself here. So. So these paintings all come together to inform something about each other that may be different when they go to a museum or somebody's collection. So in the context of this, they, are, they function as the narrative, as you can imagine, in a family portrait, in a family gathering. But when they go, they are, they are, these paintings are made to stand alone, not only from themselves, but from me. One of the things that happens in the process of painting, which maybe you as a painter will, will relate to, is that I know these paintings are finished where they're autonomous from me and resonant in a way that I recognize them as something external to myself. So when I stand here, I know I made these paintings, but I never feel they're my paintings in a way. So, so they can go everywhere. And if somebody were to acquire the whole show, for instance, um, that would be a different experience altogether than, than its individual work. Because they'd be rehung in the... Right. They, they, would, they would have a different life. A different life, life than, than this one at Blaine Southern with this life place. beyond you. Right. Like Velasquez's pictures were painted for King, King Philip of Spain. And then one day, after Velasquez was long gone, they were around the world. He doesn't know, you won't know. Yeah, I don't know most of where most of my paintings are, or I know where they are, but I've never seen them there. Yeah. Um, and people develop a relationship with them that is sometimes different and sometimes deeper. If somebody is with, I was with these paintings for a year, somebody might be with these paintings 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay, there's another painter on the other side. John, what, what, you have a question. Me? Yes, you're a painter. Well, I'm, 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 <laughs> you, you can have the microphone. Hi. It's, Hi. it's, it's <laughs> back in, in I, I thought about asking this question, but I thought that publicly... I guess you would have a question. ...would sound so dumb, and I right. look so stupid. But anyway, I'm going to do it. And one of the things that seems to be in most of the paintings that I've seen of yours is uh, very distinctive, and that is the very edge of the painting, the edges of the painting. And with your background in science and physics, it almost seems as if there is unconsciously some kind of electrical charge that establishes the painting as we see it as something of this other world, or maybe of this world, and the flashes of light that come in from the sides are perhaps our world, or maybe that's the other world. And I know that that might be quite incidental in the process of the painting, 
whether they are pinned up and brushed, and then you have them stretched. And you don't want any of the painting to be covered up. It's almost like doing a work on paper with the depth of air. And quite often there's a fragment kind of eruption to the edge of the work. But for me as an artist, when I see these works, I'm very affected by the edges and this other world that cuts in, almost like a shark, almost like a wonderful shark. And he, I, I'm going to ask you, is that like, well, that's stupid, because it's just how I painted it. Or are you very... Okay, John, we've got the question. Yeah. So, <laughs> we, we'll let Henry yeah. the answer. So, um, I appreciate the question, and, and it's interesting the way you see it. Um, so these paintings are always painted stretch. In fact, I never take my paintings out of the stretchers. I have designed these collapsible stretchers that they never have to be taken out. Um, so, but I am interested in an aspect of representation. So the idea is I create a scene, such as a C scene here, um, and then all kinds of other clues or aspects of this painting remind you that this is a made up or, or a construction. And the edges are one way in which you can tell that. The moment that the painting goes to the edges, the, the edge of the canvas become a framing device. And, and the world exists beyond the paintings. So the moment that the paintings are contained within the edges, the world is the painting. And there's nothing beyond it. And, and, the, and the aspect of a window of a painting um, functions completely different when you have that edge fracture like that. So I'm interested in creating an equilibrium in painting between presence and reference. So the reference of the sea as an idea and the presence of what it feels like to be standing in front of it. Because I think in that equilibrium between presence and reference, emotion can be held together, not just sort of an intellectual response to the paintings. Um, and there's also a way to tell the history of the paintings by the edges, but that is really ultimately incidental to the first, to the first point. I knew that incidental sense. It's almost like in the holy knowledge, it's quality and That's what it is. Okay, next question. There's a question in the front from Margie Kimmont, who made a film about the Hermitage, and you did a project with the Hermitage. Well, that's exactly what my question is about, because I, I made a film about the Hermitage, and I gather you've done a, a project there with the Hermitage, and it's a very, very special place. And I'd love to know what the project was, how it came about, where your work is situated, and what it was like working in Russia. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was extraordinary, first of all, because I, I love Russian literature. So my entire experience at St. Petersburg was, you know, framed by Dostoevsky and everybody else. So, so in many ways, you have this sense of what, what it feels like to be there and sort of one's imagination of St. Petersburg and um, all of that. Then the Hermitage itself is, a, as you know, an extraordinary and complex institution from the building itself and what it represents to, to that incredible collection. Um, so, so to have the opportunity to do a project there, you know, it's like, it's a gift, really. How did so it come about, Henry? If only relatively recently started doing contemporary art in a sort of um, not totally convinced way, uh, from, from right. my view of it. So, so, so what happened was um, Dmitry Osirkov, who is a curator at, at, um, at the Hermitage, came to my studio during one of the Basel fairs and, um, and asked me if I would be willing to do an intervention, interested in doing an intervention with the modern collection, which yeah. they have an extraordinary modern collection. Um, but then in conversations as it came up, then he said, how about if you do something, I guess Louis Bourgeois have done something a few years before me, um, right at the, in the courtyard. And they said, what if you do something for the courtyard? I was, because he saw this sculpture that I was doing that was a, that it sits now in Miami. There's one in Miami, one in Sweden. Um, and he said, what if we put that giant sculpture um, at the entrance to the Hermitage? Of course, the idea of having this gate when the Bolsheviks came in 1917 and all that, and have your sculpture there. I said, well, you know, of course, that sounds like a good idea. Um, so I love doing it. It was complicated. Um, I don't know what your experience was. It's, you know, I wanted my sculpture without a pedestal. 
that was not the easiest thing to convince a museum that that was okay. Um, but it was an extraordinary experience. I loved it, and everybody seemed to want to pose with my sculpture. It was a very big sculpture while pulling a leg up, which was an interesting thing, and I have hundreds of pictures of people posing with the leg up while <laughs> being with my sculpture. But it was, it was a, an incredible, incredible. I felt very fortunate to have that opportunity to do that. Um, that was the question, yes. And and wait, wait for the microphone. It's coming as quickly as possible. <laughs> Sorry, Jane. Thank you. How do you conciliate your activity as a writer and your activity as a painter? And do you have any preferences these days? And also, what, what may inspire you? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good and complicated question. So I am. Um, I, I, I think now most of the time about writers as I'm working, poets in particular, um, and those are the people who, who, are, who, who I feel pushed by or challenged by or inspired by. And I, in some ways, I'm not just being cute if I say that I think of this exhibition as a form of writing. I, I think if I have to pick where which camp do I sit more comfortably? I want to insist that this is some sort of large poem. Um, not poetic in that sort of goofy, flowery way, but. Um, and I sometimes imagine myself that as in the very, when I'm much older, I would only write. It never had, I don't think, but it's, 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 a moving, it's a moving goal. I don't think it will ever happen. But writing is always a big part of my life. But, but I, have this, I have noticed that as, as more time passes, I, um, I find more and more uh, pressure from writing. Um, not just my own writing, but the writing that exists. That, that's creative writing. But I, I would be interested in a version of the same question. You're teaching a course in the University of California about the Southern California about Moby Dick. Are you teaching it as a literature professor? I mean, are you teaching people who are doing PhDs on literature? Or are you t encouraging them to think differently about Moby Dick as an artist? No, I'm teaching it as a, I mean, it's, it's when my English is barely good enough, if it's, it's, it's crazy to say this, but I'm teaching it as an English professor. Okay. Um, so, and, and Moby Dick is one of my favorite books, and I felt yeah. like um, a deep dive into Moby Dick was worth doing. So, so I have some graduate students and upper class students that take it. So we, we do a, you know, um, a, a Moby Dick as, as literature. Yeah. Next question. Yes, in the middle. Hello. Um, supplementary to my friend over here's question on the uh, on the edge. I don't know if you're familiar with with Derrida's work on frame on the frame, the parergon. But I wondered why the since since the works are in a certain sense already framed by the paint not going to the edge, why is there a physical frame in addition? So this is what uh, Derrida refers to as a supplément which is something which is added to something, which indicates an absence in the thing itself. So I wondered what was, which was the structure of writing, if you like. So I wondered uh, what was going on there. Why has the respondent denied the edge, in fact? Well, actually, if you remove the, the frames, this one, one of frames from these paintings, the paintings will spill to the edges because the, you have the white of the paint canvas and the white of the walls is spilling on it. And what you will get is an image that is ragged on the edges. When an image is ragged on the edges like that, and you no, you no longer will get that sense that, um, that the, the incompleteness of these paintings as constructs, but now all the, you will have it all lose the tension. So, so a painting, a painting functions in a tension between edges and center in many, many ways. So, so that tension between edges and center depends partly on what happens in that intensity at the edge. 
So if I remove those edges, you will have paintings that are soft on the edges. Paint, these paintings will spill over. Um, so the edges contain it, and you can see, so less in these yellow ones, but if you look at that painting of the sea, you right away will see how much activity that edge is doing. And that activity would just simply look like a ragged painting against a white wall without the edges. But the painting behind everybody has two different types of edges. Right, right. And, and that happens all the time. There's no, everything in these paintings I try to consider, but not everything is, is uh, you know, there's a lot of accidents in this painting which then go through a process of examination afterwards. So, so there are parts where the edges dissolve and, and, func and disappear into the, into the canvas as you can see in the upper part of that painting there, and parts in which is, is jagged and parts in which is um, completely unpainted. And in this painting here, where we have an entire part of the painting was scraped away um, with paint stripper. So therefore, destroying the painting and problematizing this painting as a, as a credible image. That's an extreme form of edge. We'll take two more questions. Not, please, about edges. <laughs> uh, with them. Yes? OK. <laughs> That's very generous of you. No, thank you very much. Yeah. I enjoyed it. Um, the paintings and what you're saying. Sitting here, especially looking at these, the striptych of three yellow paintings, the word that comes to mind is apocalyptic. Um, is this just my response, or is this something which is part of your feelings when you're working? Uh, no, I, don't, I do not think of my work as apocalyptic or, um, or somebody, when I walked in, mentioned catastrophic. Um, so, but I do, I do think that there is a constant churning between possibility and hope and destruction and loss. And I'm interested in that cycle. Um, the tendency of, of, of artists is to distribute themselves, for the most part, into two groups. They're epic artists who are interested in sort of that epic journey of history or time or those kinds of movement, history painters. And then there's ar artists that are preoccupied in sort of domestic experience. They individually felt or specific turnings of culture and so on. I'm interested in both. I'm interested in the sphere of, of the epic as it has friction against the sphere of the ordinary and domestic. So, so the rotation of those two spheres creates certain friction, and that friction is a friction of living. So, so this, this work at times seems ominous, but then if you look carefully, you realize that there's certain possibility, not because I want to make the world hopeful and give it a happy ending, but rather because ultimately that's, that's the tension that makes, that seems truthful to me. These paintings are things that I don't know beforehand. So rather, I don't have anything to teach. I don't have anything to give. I don't have a didactic mission with these paintings. Rather, I use these paintings to understand life better. And in the process of that search, just like a, maybe a philosopher might try to write something or a mathematician solve a problem, and trying to solve a problem with these paintings. And that problem is, tends to be an equilibrium between destruction and creation. Or, and I don't care to balance it. If something is completely catastrophic, let it be. But overall, my project, I wouldn't say that. There's nothing to be gained for me to create a practice around catastrophe. Also, there is nothing, nothing to be gained from having a confessional practice. A lot of times, people look at my biography and then imagine that these paintings are paintings of loss by an exile. And it's a very, a very quick equation which ignores all kinds of other things that are present in the works. And I don't, in, I don't care to really tell my story. I would tell my friends. I already told my story so much, I'm sick of it. So what <laughs> I want to do with these paintings is discover something new about how to live life better. OK, the final question is the man in the white shirt who handed the mic. Oh, maybe he doesn't want to. There's a man with a pink tie who's anxious to ask the last question. And As you probably know, the New York and New York Expressionists 
sometimes made a distinction between the process of art, of painting, of sculpting, etc., and the final product, the painting. Do you make a distinction between the two that one is more important than the process, the final result of it, let's say? Yeah, I do. I, I think that in, in painting only the end product matters. As you can see from, my, from, my, from the video, I am very, very involved in, pro in the process of making it. But I think ultimately, for me, the process as an end in itself in some manner becomes indulgent. I think that um, there's anybody who has been in a studio knows that there's all kinds of exciting and sexy and fun things that happen in the process of making a painting. But uh, to me, they don't really matter. A painting, a painting ultimately uh, collapses or succeeds ultimately in what, how it ends, ends, ends up. Um, so, and it is really ultimately in how you complete, enough, there are few things as hard as completing a painting. And I'm not saying that I have done a good job, but certainly every painter who tries to complete it, you know that a painting can start really well almost every time. And even midway through it, be really good. But a painting to end well is a rare occasion. So, um, but, the, but I think sometimes there is something very seductive and in ultimately very fetishistic and indulgent about the seduction of process. And I think that what matters in a painting is, does it work or doesn't work? And then the question is, how do you, what parameters or criteria you use to make that decision? OK, well, now that Enrique has said that the book is not a necessary part of understanding the exhibition, <laughs> I can maybe say that actually it is, I found, helpful because it has an interview at the beginning which is a very thoughtful and informative interview. And it is interesting as a book, I found, because it's divided between reproductions of the finished work in colour and then in sort of greyer tones, work in progress with some of the documentation. So that, um, of course, judge it, please enjoy the exhibition. But, Le, but let me say that I do think it's an amazing book and I, it's a great yeah, source yeah. to understand the work. What I meant is the reproductions, which are extraordinary, and they took great pains to reproduce this work really accurately. Um, is different than the experience of being in the work. Yeah, but no, I think what I, you said is correct. In no. the end, the exhibition, the work is the work. You shouldn't need or require the book. But, but it is but, very but nice. But you can buy the book shortly, <laughs> signed by Enrique. So can I please, once again, thank you all for coming on this hot evening. I hope you've all voted. And thank Enrique, most of all, for talking so incredibly thoughtfully and well about his work, about his life, which he may not like doing and has done many times before. But I think, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.